or should I say, your son has done a fantastic time lapse video of your good self uh, measuring a boat. And uh, it might be just worth our while now just having a little look at that. And, sure, uh, yeah. Let's just let that run through. I mean, and see it's, in action. Yeah, we've got, I think Dan is in the audience tonight. So this is Dan's Contessa 32. We, um, we go through the same process. It doesn't matter what sort of boat it is, but we, you know, but I find it, I'm a bit old fashioned, mainly because I've been doing this for so long, is that I don't really like to let anybody else do the measuring. I like to do the measurement for myself. Um, you need a nice calm day, as you can see here, there's not a breath of wind, and it's the perfect conditions for measuring. And the more accurate we, we, this process is, the better chance of getting the perfect sail from our design team. Um, yeah. the, desi the, 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 um, the measurement form, very detailed, as there's at least 100 measurements need to be taken. There's the long measurements, you know, the, the overall rig geometry, but then there's all the fiddly stuff. And it's more often than not the fiddly stuff that can make the difference between a really beautiful fit and a, and a, a not quite so nice fit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I always, it always amazes me how much time it requires to measure the boat properly. And as you say, there's well over a hundred data points are captured. And I, and I suppose this leads us on now, guys, into Jeremy's realm, because once we have, a, you know, if it's an existing boat, we have to measure it and that creates uh, that data goes forward into a rudimentary rig model and then i suppose after that it's over to uh, jeremy and uh, and jeremy's design world so uh, it's funny you say prof there's, there's often there's often more information in your 100 measurements than there is in a sail plan oh really sometimes the sail plans and deck plans are a bit sketchy and uh, even on some, some of the new builds, we'd rather have a measurement form like you guys give us. Um, but, uh, you know, generally the stuff that's not there, we can, um, you know, we can, we can dig out, eventually we can dig out the builders or designers. But, um, but I guess, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is, this is an idea of how, how it works from, you know, from your clipboard to our screen. Yeah. So I, 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 I suppose just to give uh, our audience just a, a, a concept now, what, what we've done in, in all our rehearsals and run-throughs run of this, Jeremy and his, his team go through such a, 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 an array and a, and a, 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 a spread of um, analysis and rigor and software and different modules and stuff. We, we were trying to figure out how we would get this all into a webinar, which is one hour long. And the best way uh, that we came up with was that Jeremy pre-recorded um, the, the steps that he goes through when creating design. So what we're gonna do now, guys, is we're gonna play this uh, recording and Jeremy has narrated over it. And uh, I think you'll be very impressed. So, uh, so here goes. I love that um, time lapse time lapse you've um, you've done. I haven't seen that before. And, um, I think I certainly haven't seen any more guys work that quick, so it'll be a bit of uh, encouragement. Um, I stopped it here at that bit where you're diligently taking notes, and I wanted to just run through how how that comes to us, how that um, turns into a, a a 3D model that we design from. Um, that we can assess using the tools and how that then goes into production. So um, all of the measurements that you uh, take here um, at, uh, at breakneck speed um, come to us in the form of uh, a spreadsheet um, that actually has some error checking built in. So I think uh, you, I believe you often use this on the uh, while you're uh, on your way there to check um, check it as you go and by some you know, wizardry of, uh, of IT um, when the orders enter that actually appears in our design manager here so we can call it up by the order number which in this case was uh, there was this one here um, so we see it's the Contessa with the single spreader rig and we see all of the uh, measurements that you took there so if I whack this magic button here then what I get is uh, a model 
of the Contessa 33, which is all generated using the 32 rather, which has been um, generated by the measurements that you have taken. So there's a, a plenty of um, checking uh, required at this stage before we actually uh, draw any sales for the boat. But uh, in effect, a lot of this is, um, is, is, is done for us. Now, this particular order was um, for a client who I think you'd already um, built a mainsail for, so we would probably pull in that mainsail here. Um, and that appears. And we are interested here in an AP Genoa, I believe. So we'll pull in a reference design here, which would be the Genoa. And voila. So We'll just open these sales in our um, molding software, get an idea of what they look like. So uh, link it, you'll miss it as the sale designs run. So looking here at um, general, obviously on the left, mainsail on the right, and without getting into too many of the sort of um, uh, details of the design we we, we aside from the edge lengths obviously which are critically important we um, you'll probably hear us talking about edge curves and broad seams and so this uh, broad seam is effectively the shape that's built into the sail the shape that um, is the is the seam shape that uh, we can't really remove by trimming the by trimming the sail this is an uh, this is a graphical indication here of of where the broad seam is in the sail and um, an idea that there is so much more broad seam in a, in a Genoa, for example, than there is in a, in a mainsail. So that's um, uh, a little diversion into sail designers uh, chat. Um, what, we're, what we're interested in doing here is uh, an AP Genoa, which is slightly shorter overlap than um, the number one that we've uh, that we've already got. So this one here is a 5.85 meter LP, which is about 150%. Now that we think is based on the discussion that um, Nigel would have had with the client, a little bit um, too big for this particular uh, use. So if we say that we're going for 130%, then we're about 5.2 meters uh, LP. So we'll put that in and we'll run it. Uh, the clue height here of 300 mil is maintained uh, and that looks more like it so we're pretty much at the front of the track here um, which is uh, which is good and that's updated here in the Desmond model so that is much of the geometry work done blasting through it and uh, ignoring for, for the moment plenty of important details. But I just want to get through how we um, get an idea of how we go from the what we call the molded shapes here. These you know, are clearly not uh, flying shapes of the sails. Uh, how we go from these mold shapes um, to, to a, a prediction of what the flying shape will be because ultimately the, the client, the end user is in, interested in the flying shape, not necessarily the uh, molded shape. So for that, I'm going to switch to another project um, simply because it's one that's actually on my desk this week and it's just kind of easier. So we will flip in here to membrane, which is um, which is which is our flying shape model. Now, what do we need for what, what do we need to turn a a uh, static geometry model like this into um, uh, an aerostructural model. We need uh, some well, we, we need some indication of the, the wind pressures on the sails. So uh, we're actually looking here now at a six meter uh, because that's a project that's on my desk uh, this week. And that's visibly closer to a flying shape. And that's because we've taken the mold shapes, we've applied some wind pressure that has come from here. Uh, this is our uh, flow aero, um, aero software. Uh, we're running here in 14 knots of wind at about 35 wind angle and a 
generous heel angle of about 24 knots, uh, sorry, 24 degrees. So we take the um, wind pressure from here, we use it to load the rig, and with um, a little bit of magic around the structure of the rig and the pretensions uh, and the dock tune, then what results is a, uh, is a fully trimmable um, structural model of the sails. And everything in this um, section down here are, are the elements that we can change in the model. So we have um, tapes and material properties for tapes. We'll come back to that in a, a little bit. Uh, we've got cables for all of the standing rigging and all of the sheets. Uh, six meter has reasonably complicated inline rig with jumpers, uh, backstay runners, and um, and uh, deflectors. So any of these we can we can adjust on it and affect any of the sail controls that we would have in the boat. We have built in here to the model. Uh, so for example, let's uh, we're targeting a mid twist of nine degrees here and. Why are we targeting nine degrees? So we might have um, photographs of a similar similar boat or uh, another sail in the wardrobe that we might want to use as a design reference. You've probably seen um, the guys uh, looking at sail scans like this. So this is a, a 38 footer here. We're looking at scans of the head so on the left, main on the right. And there are some key uh, metrics here that we can translate into design worlds, such as um, the mid camber, which is the, the camber of the mid stripe in this case, is about 9%. Mid twist, which is how twist it's a, it, effectively, it's the, it's the best measure of how hard you're sheeting the sail. So uh, it's the twist of the mid stripe relative to the boom. In this case, it's about 10 degrees. So in the six meter model, the moment we're targeting nine degrees in mid twist, now let's change that so it's 10 and uh, the model will use the main sheet uh, slightly until the mid twist is up to 10 degrees. So that's more like it. Um, here we've got a quick view of, of, of any of the tensions in any of the rigging elements and some of the uh, flying shape parameters that we are um, keeping an eye on. There's a more detailed input here for any of the, the, the shapes. This is um, an indication of the flying mast bend, uh, grey being the flying bend and red being the um, effectively the, the luff curve of the sail. So in this particular condition, the, um, the luff curve, the, we are sort of matching the luff curve of the main. Um, we're not pulling we're not flattening the sail by, by bending the rig more than the luff curve, uh, nor are we um, forcing shape in uh, by setting up a rig straighter than the luff curve of the main. So that's a quick view of what's happening in the mainsail. Uh, in the headsail uh, luff sag, uh, we've got 0.4%, which is a pretty low number. Now we're probably more interested in seeing what this looks like in uh, 3D, so bear with me here while I um, some other bits and pieces on. So the red shapes that we can see here are the molded shapes of these sails. So uh, effectively the, the, the shapes of the sails as they would have been uh, molded, as they would have been built on the molds. Obviously we build one shape but there's a, a, an infinite range of flying shapes that, that any sail can, can adopt um, through through. Uh, some, um, you know, and, and sometimes we're encouraging uh, stretch in certain parts of the sails to um, allow them to change shape in an advantageous way. So here is the difference in um, static unloaded shape in red and uh, trimmed design shape, uh, sorry, and trimmed flying shape in, in, in grey. And, and this really is what we're, we're interested in. And as designers, we're, we're trying to find a, uh, a mold shape and a structure that gives us the range of flying shapes that, that we want for that particular rig setup, for that particular design. Uh, and, and doing this um, while um, 
specify the most efficient structure for the sale. So what I mean by that is here. So we're looking now at uh, how the tapes in this particular um, sale set are working uh, at this condition. So in, in 40 knots here, and we're looking at the strain in, in the tapes. The hardest working part of the sale plan is the loft of the jib. So it's often the area that's uh, the most loaded. Uh, and we have an allowable yarn strain for 3DI, which is in the region of 0.2%. Uh, and here the upper limit in this view is about 0.15%. So the, um, the hardest working tapes, which are in the sort of red purple zone, are comfortably below the 0.2% strain limit. So, so this, is, um, this is good. Uh, we would probably uh, check this sail combination in maybe slightly more wind. And to make sure that the um, flying shapes and the structures are still doing the, what, what we hope they are uh, going to be doing. And then, in a way, it becomes the moment of truth because uh, once we've decided on our, uh, on our geometry, on our um, broad seam and our structure, it's kind of time to commit. So um, at that point, the sail becomes buildable. And there's one more step here is to actually run the tape structure for the sail. So we're looking at the, at the head saw here for the six meter. Uh, we're happy with the design. So we're going to run the uh, 3DI uh, tape template for this particular uh, sail. So this is um, composite engineering in action, I suppose, for sales. This is a part that used to take a hell of a long time. It was certainly a cup of coffee, if not two. Um, and now with a new piece of software that's about a year, 18 months old, it's uh, 16 seconds odd. So um, we have two different displays here, one showing some of the parametric curves that we use to define the tape groups. And, and the other in the middle here showing the, the, the resulting tapes for this particular sale. So let's look at the uh, each structure, for example. So this is the, um, the leech structure for this Genoa. Um, we have, um, you can see here what, what the particular tapes are in use, um, what the mass is. Uh, and we get an idea of the of a, a quick overview here of the of the density and the orientations. Um, there are some other interesting bits here because this, for example, is um, the six meter has slides. So there's a group of tapes here which are slightly hard to see, but um, which was some reinforcement at each of the slide groups. Also have the, for the spreader and for the jumpers. So that is the spreader patch for the jumper. And this here is the spreader patch for the for the spreader. And that and, and these are and these are spreader patches which are built into the 3DI structure. So um, that all flows from the measurements that would have been taken by the salesman um, originally. So when that is done, we save the, um, save the taping structure. And that, if anyone has any done any boat building or any composite engineering, then this sort of um, presentation will be quite familiar. This is effectively a laminate schedule, uh, and it's how we describe the way that the sails are, are built. Um, starting from the, the first tape that's laid down by the machinery, which will be a, an exterior, a boundary tape, then an exterior tape group here on the left, uh, some spreader patches and hank reinforcements that we saw a primary lead structure, loft structure, and then effectively the mirror image on the other side of the sail because the, the sails are the 3D sails are symmetric uh, through the um, thickness of the laminate stack. 
and then finally the exterior tape on the top. So anyone that's um, built boats, built bulkheads, built any composite, a ski, a snowboard, um, will be familiar with um, with this sort of um, structural description. And it really is the, the kind of proof, I guess, um, in engineering terms that we are uh, talking about a, a, a composite structure here, not, uh, not a textile. And I think that's probably enough for me for now. The guys have lined up uh, a pretty cool video of um, what this uh, looks like um, in production and it's the point where you know the sail moves from uh, our virtual world uh, back into the real world um, the manufacturer uh, and ultimately uh, back to the client. Wow that's all, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can say Jezer. Um, that was absolutely fantastic and uh, uh, called me a, a, a total convert, but that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, how was that for you, as they would say? <laughs> well, I mean, one of my colleagues once said that they all look the same on the laptop, you know, they're all the little stick models, it's an A4 size a piece of paper, but um, it all flows from the measurements that, uh, you know, that you guys take. So ultimately that's, uh, um, you know, it reflects all of the, the hard work of, of you know, the diligent work of sales guys at the start. Right, right. Absolutely amazing. Well, I suppose the, um, the thing about this is um, the, the, the wonderful work that you and your team do, Jez, uh, as you say, is in the, the virtual uh, world. And, and I was actually fascinated that as you ran the software, you could hear the processor fan lighting up to cool down the processors. And, uh, and I know you're going to talk about some of the... Uh, the awesome computing power that you use in some of these projects uh, a little bit later on. Um, but I suppose what, what, what is uh, amazing about the, the North uh, production, 3DI production, is that the production technology uh, in the factory enables us to produce sales uh, to match the level of design power um, that Jeremy and his team does. And as you can see here on the left, uh, we've got a 1720 uh, uh, doing some sail trials in Cork Harbour, and you can see the uh, the scarf joins uh, here in the 3DI mainsail structure, and uh, you can see the 3DI structure there with the sun shining through it. And uh, and on the right, uh, Andrew Craig's J109 Chimera uh, sailing upwind with her Code One jib in about 10 knots of true wind, and uh, that was uh, that was the boat that we won the Scotter series with last May, and uh, and uh, they were just beautiful. So. Um, so what we're going to do, guys, is um, flowing from that, we're going to now show you the new, uh, a, a new piece of video, which basically goes through how we bring the incredible work that uh, Jeremy and his team, uh, how, we, how, we, how we bring it to life. So uh, let's see this, and uh, we'll be back to you very shortly.
So there you have it, guys. Uh, that was just a short video um, showing the, the, the 3DI manufacturing technology that allows, uh, that allows us to bring the, the extraordinary work that Germany and the, and the design team uh, do in North Sales. And I suppose now it's uh, probably over to you, Shane, for um, just a little bit of uh, further discussion just on how we link that, the design work with the actual finished product itself. Yeah, absolutely. Can I chip in here, Shane, or just before, yeah, you, before you take it up? Um, yeah. I think one of the things that we didn't, you know, we didn't really um, mention, I suppose, in, in my little clip was um, the consistency that the production process gives us. And there was, a, there was a really good question there in the chat. I'm not quite sure from, who was it from, uh, from Dave Cullen, right? If, uh, if we have the same boat, will two different designers end up with a different tail design? And as a, as a great question. And I would say that um, 10, maybe even five years ago, that would have been a maybe. Um, but that was before we had the machinery that you see here, um, which will produce a given design uh, very consistently one time or the other. In fact, that's, for example, why North Sales were chosen to, to build a one design inventory for the Volvo 65, because we could prove that we could build a one design inventory of sales super consistently. So then the question about the, the designer input. So that's something that we've worked equally hard at um, sort of, uh, you know, we have a, a unified sort of process across the whole design team. Uh, that's really only come about in probably the last five years since, um, since our kind of company ownership changed in a way where the, um, each loft was, was not a separate business as it used to be with its own designers and in effect competing against each other to a certain extent. Now all the lofts are wholly owned and there's a real um, motivation, uh, not just commercially, but, but on, on every level um, that every designer produces uh, a consistent product that, that they uh, will produce the same design. We have now got systems in place and design libraries in place uh, which will ensure that the human side is consistent uh, and also as you've seen in the video the, the production side is consistent so i think you know now finally with the last sort of uh, three or four years we can genuinely say that um the same design will will be will be produced by by two different designers given the same brief but of course two different clients aren't the same and that's the the strength that we have is that we can turn the you know the um the, the, the brief and the kind of ambition for one sale for one particular uh, client. Uh, we can sort of steer the design that way uh, or for another client who might sail in a flat water venue or um, only do offshore sailing, we sort of steer the design in the other way. And that's the, that's the discussion that, 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 you know, Prof, Shano, uh, Nigel and the guys are really good at having with, uh, with all of the clients to make sure that they get the particular sale that they want, uh, not the, um, the, the, the stock standard copy, you know, the, the stock standard design uh, that we would otherwise build them. Good stuff, Desert. Brilliant. Um, so, Prof, Prof, could I just chip in there? Chip in away, Nigel. Go Good for man. it. Good man. We've got a great question there from Liam. Uh, uh, Liam Lynch, just back, in, uh, back down the, the order there. Liam was asking, um, and I answered it very briefly, but maybe Jez could expand on this. He was asking, yeah. would the design with, is the original design for the same sale in different materials? Will it, will it, you know, if you change from a polyester 3DI, let's say to a carbon 3DI, will the design of the sale be the same or will, it, will there be some changes required to, to get the same flying shape? Um, there will be some changes in the mold shape, yes. Um, so if you cast your mind back, uh, Nigel, uh, when let's say you were selling uh, crosscut Dacron sales or maybe um, tri-radial laminate sales. Yeah. Often sales, for Nigel's case. <laughs> <laughs> At that stage, uh, you know, when it was cotton and Dacron and laminates, the design difference required to produce an identical flying shape was enormous. And that was one of the things that I just couldn't get my head around when I started doing this in sort of, you know, the early noughties. I just couldn't rationalize that you needed to cut a crosscut Dacron sail, which pretty much backwards broad seam in order yeah. to achieve a straight leach. Um, whereas if you're building that same sail in triradial laminate, 
you would cut a completely different, a completely different mold shape. So it used to be the case with radically different materials that the designs were required to be radically different to achieve a vaguely similar flying shape. And that's where the real skill of the old, the old school um, uh, artisans sort of shone through, you know, and guys of, you know, Nigel would have, would have learned his craft from those guys. I have, I, I pretty much only break sewing machines, so I kind of don't really know any of that. Um, but what I, what I do have a better feel for now in the, in the world of um, 3DI and, uh, you know, composite sale uh, production is that, um, yes, there are still uh, differences between the design, but they are quite subtle. Uh, so, for instance, in the, in the range of um, fibres that we use, uh, polyester, um, aramid, um, uh, spectra, and carbon. Um, one of the key, one of the key um, evolutions, I guess, uh, innovations is that in, in all of those materials, the 3DI process unspins the yarns, so each of the filaments is dead straight. And the reality is that uh, the first part of the stretch of any sail is, is not really elastic stretch. It's not really elastic stretch of the yarns, it's kind of the mechanical unwinding of the fact that the yarns are spun. And with 3DI, all of that is, is taken out in manufacture. So the first bit of give in the sale, let's say, before it becomes elastic is, is gone. We, we take that out in manufacture. And that's, um, that, that means that the, that the fibers behave much more similar to each other and we don't need the big design difference that we used to have. Now, it is still the case that a stiffer material, and by stiffer, I mean, one that doesn't stretch as much. It's still the case that um, that sail will be molded slightly deeper than a slightly more elastic fiber like um, polyester, for instance. Because if we're to, if we're to achieve a, a, a given flying shape under load, then the polyester sail will be um, slightly more elastic, will kind of um, find its way into that shape with a little bit more movement than the carbon sail. So to arrive there, we mold more depth into the carbon sail, into the stiffer sail. But those differences really are very subtle. You know, they'd be in the order of uh, maybe a quarter of a percent of camber on the mold. Um, whereas, you know, back in the old days, uh, the molds would have been unrecognizable from one material to another. And tell us, Jez, uh, what's the feedback loop? There's a, a, a great question there from Jackie Taylor. What's the feedback loop? if you like, back to you and the design team from, I guess, you know, in, in engineering terms, out in the field, given that the field is the sea? Um, I, I mean, that's, I guess, where, you know, you and your colleagues in the sales team um, are, you know, kind of the second half of, um, of, of where you guys come into it, really. Um, you know, the first half being supplying, you know, really accurate, comprehensive set of details that, you know, allow us to kind of look good, I suppose. Uh, and the second is, um, you know, is doing the sale trials, is sailing with the clients, is, is bringing all of that, everything that you learn about the, the sales and about how the boat works with the sales, uh, bringing it back to, um, to the design group so that we can kind of put that into the, into the mix for the next set of sales for that boat or that next, um, let's say the next uh, design for a particular one design class. Uh, and that's by way of um, the, the, the sales scan that, that we saw. Uh, but that really is, is probably less than half the story. You know, it's, um, you know, as any good helmsman will tell you, it's, you can often not verbalize why a boat's fast. It just is fast. It feels fast. And um, the, the, the good feedback is, um, is to, is to put, you know, something sort of objective on that sort of feedback, um, be it uh, rudder angles, be it uh, shape range, be it extended range of a sail, um, be it uh, user friendliness or, or what I use it as hard to define, but let's say a sail that requires less trimming and less babysitting um, through, uh, through a beat, uh, a jib that would allow you to spend more time on the rail rather than, uh, you know, micro trimming every, uh, every, every gust. Um, those are all positive, um, you know, feedbacks that uh, that we don't pick up from the sales scans. So that's all. That's all sort of part of it. And the feedback loop really is is um, partly objective, partly subjective, and um, it's still super important. You know, that's the bit that we we don't get out of the computer. 
good see, stuff. Uh, just, just to follow on, Prof, there, there's a question from Ella Boxall. We'll just do a quick one because it follows on from that point. Uh, would you use a design from between boats in the same class saying this worked for them or didn't work for them? Well, that kind of following on from Jez, we do that all the time, especially in the one design um, sphere. So like J70s, you know, constantly refining, developing products and say in the Swan 50 class, which, you know, I do a little bit there, um, we actually meet together all the North sales representatives and discuss um, a lot of, uh, you know, the issues we're seeing with the sales and we're working together as a team to kind of try and refine the offering for all of the teams. So uh, as Jez has kind of pointed out, there, there's much more sort of, uh, you know, a unification amongst the North sales uh, staff and team uh, to try and work together to, to make everyone's products good, not just particularly one team. Good stuff. I'd say, I'd say, Shane, oh, your Swan 50 meetings are a bit more glamorous than the North sales Ireland meetings and horse and jockey, are they? Yeah, yeah. I think the last one was on the top deck of the um, Yacht Club Costa Smeralda, so, um, or the one I was at, and yeah, Probably a little bit more glamorous than the horse and jockey, but you know, tea, you know, the tea and coffee is pretty good, and the horse and jockey, I won't, yeah. we won't get stuff. Rag it um, there's a question there from Dennis Ellis If 3DI sales aren't carbon, why are they still black? Who wants to answer that, lads? Oh, that's one for Nige, isn't it? Yeah, well, there's, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an article. I was going to send you a link, Dennis. There's an article written by JV Braun, who is uh, the head of 3DI, I think. That's right, Jezza, isn't it, at the moment? JB? Uh, he's the sort of global, well, he's the global design director, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so JB wrote an article, Dennis, so I'll send you the link to that so you can read it all. But, but basically, the, um, you know, when we were, blend, it started with 3DL sales, when we were doing the blends in the early days, the Aramid, when you blended the Aramid with the carbon, you had this sort of yellow fiber and black fiber mixing together. And it looked quite nice at times, but yeah, the, the, the the black look in sales was uh, deemed to be more fashionable. And so the Aramid fiber in those days got dyed black. And then that sort of carried over into the, into the 3DI product as well. I mean, the original, a lot of the original uh, 3DI cells we did, they were gray, I think, Jez one, they were slightly green. And it was due to the, the blend of fibers that were in there, none of which were, were dyed in any way. And then there was, the, there was always a chafe layer on the outside. And basically we have the three tiers of sale now. We have what we call ocean, endurance, and raw. Ocean, I mean, they sort of self-explanatory, but the, the endurance and raw product are quite close to each other. The endurance product has a chafe layer on the outside and the raw product doesn't. So in the early days, when we were mixing sales from in the inventory, where you'd have some raw, some endurance, the sales just didn't match and it didn't look nice on the boats. So there was a call to uh, just to, to make the sales look similar in the inventory and just improve the aesthetics of the whole thing. So a lot of it's aesthetics. The carbon only comes in black, I think, Jason. You can't get it in any other color. Um, <laughs> Unless you can so, dig out a new color of carbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, so, so, so that's pretty much it, Dennis. A lot of it driven by fashion, and uh, I've got a lot of it to, to match the sale inventory, so it didn't look you should, out of sync. You should mention the, um, the the Nordak, uh, 3D Nordak and Nige, which are quite, you know. Oh, of course, yeah. Nordic sorry, uh, sorry, Jesse. Yeah, that's so, the exception to the to the to the um, the dark ones, and and they're they're incredible sales for. Yeah, know. it's interesting actually because uh, as the boys might have intimated earlier, I, I I did handle a few cotton sales, but I never actually made any because <laughs> that's quite some time ago. <laughs> but um, the uh, you know the transition. The, there's been several transitions in sail making and in the way the designs have had to be implemented. And uh, the, the change to 3DL was a big change and then the change to 3DI was another major change. But the, diff the, the time span between those two changes was something like 25 years, I think, something like that. The, the 3DL product ran for a long, long time before 3DI came along. But when 3DI came along, initially it was absolutely fantastic. And then we got used to that. It's, I mean, if, if people have used 3DI, they know I don't need to tell them about that. They're an unbelievable product. It's so different to anything else out there in the market. But, the, but then we ran that product for about eight, nine, nearly 10 years. And we got very used to it, but we didn't, we didn't have it in, in anything but a race product, really. 
and then it came out as as a polyester option and that for me i got the most excited about nordax gdi as a product over any other product that we've ever launched i think because you basically are taking a fiber that everybody thinks has had its day and is not really used in 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 a performance type sale anymore and uh, now it's being used in 3di and so that product is is pure white um but it has it, it reacts and flies just like a regular 3di sail be it aramid or carbon or, uh, or or spectra but it is a little bit more give it moves around a little bit more so hence the design will be slightly different as we were talking to liam but uh, but there are there are a little bit of color options so you can still have white dennis if you'd like white great good stuff nice 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 one and i suppose Nigel, as you were talking about you know uh, 3di nordac uh, white polyester and then the 3di endurance products and 3di raw products and I, I suppose we consolidated them now into three groups which are 3di ocean 3di endurance and 3di raw um, it's probably worth Shane, maybe just a, a quick summation of you know how does the 3di process how does that enable that design work that jeremy jeremy's group does yeah, exactly, Prof. That was really good. And uh, I think all the questions were well worth answering there as well. Really good questions. Um, yeah, like it's really important, as we've seen from Jez's, uh, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, uh, illustrations uh, earlier on to this evening. I mean, there's a huge amount of value added through the design process. So it's very important that that's met with an equally robust and efficient uh, manufacturing process and, and product. And, and ultimately, that's what we believe 3DI is. It's, it's, it's market leading. And, and as all of the reasons we've just kind of explained there, uh, why it's market leading. Um, and I guess some of the key points of differentiation, uh, one of the, probably the primary one is the fact that it's a composite uh, and more directly a flexible composite, which is a very hard thing to achieve and required quite a lot of uh, smart people spending a lot of time and money um, creating it. Um, you know, as opposed to what the predecessor, 3DL, or any of the other string sale products, um, you, you know, the advantages of it being a composite are huge. And maybe the, the most, the primary one I think is most visible is the fact that the sale doesn't suffer from delamination. I mean, that's a huge value add to the sale. I mean, that was the biggest primary killer um, of uh, the laminate sales. So, I mean, that that's a huge plus. Um, also, the composition of the sale is quite different to a laminate. Um, and I'll just cover this very quickly because, you know, we don't want to keep people here all night. But, you know, the composition of a 3DI sale is effectively 70% fiber um, and 30% adhesive, zero laminate, zero plastic film in it. Um, so really, it's just, uh, as, as Kenny Reid would say, that all the good stuff, um, none of the parasitic weight. And that, what we mean by parasitic weight is, is kind of the films that, really are just there on uh, string sales or you know uh, laminate sales effectively just to hold the load path fibers in place um, really uh, to sandwich them in place and they have very they add very little in terms of performance or structural benefit and um, they take some of the offline loads so then they're, they're not really very useful especially not for the amount of weight that they take up in the sale um, and just to give you an idea we can see here uh, Classically, uh, the film weight is about 50% of the total uh, um, weight of a, of a, a laminate sail. Um, and as we said, we've just removed that and replaced it with fiber. The weight is, is fiber. In a 3DI, that's up to 70. So that's a huge change. And it, that adds a couple of benefits. Um, obviously, if, if the sails were the same weight, you'd have a huge increase in modulus or stretch resistance in the sail. Um, but also you get a great uh, benefits in terms of shape stability. And I think Jez kind of talked more about that. So I won't recap that. But in terms of how this, this sale performs and how uh, it trims, the, you know, there's, there's, there's loads of benefits to the 3DI process, but those are some of the key ones. Good man. That's, I, I love that word parasitic, Shano, because the plastic is parasitic. It sucks the goodness out of a sale and there is no plastic and no film in a 3DI sale. So I think we'll, uh, we'll have a little looking glass now into the future and um, uh, Jeremy has, uh, uh, has put together just a, 
a, a little taster of some of the amazing work that we're, we're, we're what I say we, his group are doing. And uh, it's sort of a glimpse into the sort of uh, direction and uh, um, sort of um, way that his design group are going and what the sort of work uh, they're looking at. Right, so I'll try and blast through very quickly some of the some of the other projects that we take on through North uh, Design Service. And um, I, I guess I was blagging slightly uh, early on, I haven't really been involved in the production uh, design for a little while. Um, I've been running our design consultancy business called uh, North Design Services. So we work across the North Technology Group companies, that's across uh, North Sales, across Soil Spars, uh, Future Fibers, the rigging supplier, uh, and now, interestingly, uh, some brands that were previously licensed, like Whiteboarding, uh, North Windsurfing, and um, well, probably not so much North Clothing, there's not a huge amount we can offer them, but um, there's plenty of interesting work. So um, this is a snapshot of uh, our Aero code that we have used faithfully for, for many years, um, and we still do daily. Um, and, and funny enough, uh, Prof asked me the other day what kind of laptop I have because he, he, heard it, he heard the fan going nuts in the uh, previous clip and he tried to levitate. And uh, the answer is it's, a, it's an old relic really that I use for little more than email because these days when we do aero simulations on uh, projects like this, we're talking about solving the flow in a very, very large um, area or a volume around the yacht. Um, so whether it's this sort of project whether it's the um, uh, foiling cup boats, uh, there is really no short, there's no, there's no substitute for horsepower when it comes to computing. Uh, so it's laptop out and it's uh, supercomputers in. And this is one of the clusters that we have exclusive access to at the University of Southampton, where um, luckily they still talk to me despite um, uh, my time there many years ago. And that's been a, a, a huge asset to us um, in the last couple of years. Uh, in the hydro side, uh, we pay just as much attention on the hydro side as, as you'll see. And we used to do uh, a hell of a lot of this sort of thing. So uh, model tank testing, um, and this is fascinating stuff. Uh, but today, this also is done in, uh, mainly in the cluster. Uh, we're looking now at a, I think, a Wally Cento overtaking a 12 meter, which are two projects that uh, we have looked at recently. Um, so why do we why are we so interested in the hydro side? And the, the answer really is that when we uh, collaborate with teams, with designers, yards, project managers to figure out some of the um, less obvious questions, then we have, to, we have to pay as much attention on the hydro side as the, as the aero side. Um, the, uh, they, are, they are both as important as each other in terms of uh, outright performance. So taking one example here, which was a, a turbo study for a Maxi 72. That we helped with uh, last year, uh, looking at a bunch of different length options, draft options, uh, combinations of both. Um, it is just as important that we understand that the hydro as uh, the aero, because ultimately the two of them come together in our VPP. And that's how we uh, quantify the differences between the different uh, options that the teams, the designers, clients want, want to look at. So on the left, we're looking at an upwind uh, simulation of the Maxi 72. So upwind uh, trims, attitudes, speeds uh, from eight to 20 knots. Uh, on, the, on the right, we're looking at a downwind simulation for a, a bigger um, super yacht. Uh, again, sort of 10 to, 10 to 20 knot trims and uh, VPP solutions. So all of that then comes together in uh, a very simple presentation sort of like this. So this is the sort of, um, a presentation that we might use uh, typically for a super yacht project where a race around uh, the island of St. Bart's is uh, something that's well kind of understood by everybody. Um, and we're looking here on the left at a chart of relative elapsed time difference uh, between a, a reference hull, which is the sort of horizontal line here, uh, and some other candidates. So we had a, a red hull, which is um, slower across the board, a green one, which is um, which is much more competitive, but still not as good as the, the, the reference boat. Uh, and uh, a black option here, which is uh, significantly better in light airs, comparable in the medium uh, with, a, with, a, with a small deficit uh, above 16. So 
this is the sort of presentation that enables a, a team, a client, a, a yard to, to make um, best informed decisions about which uh, configurations they are going to choose. And, and finally, when we've when the clients decided rather um, the configuration that uh, is, is is going forward, we will finish our work generally with a with a very comprehensive study of all of the um, the loading um, of the sail plan and the deck. So we'll look at every combination of sail uh, through a range of different wind speeds, uh, all the expected conditions, plenty of unexpected ones, uh, and some off-design conditions to get a, a very clear understanding of. Uh, what's required of the of the deck and hull engineering uh, as regards sail plan loading. Then, um, finally, uh, a look at some some of the more recent projects, uh, and the, I guess the diversity of recent projects. We've got everything from the, the J class, uh, heavier, slower um, monohulls, um, but still you know, hugely popular. Some inshore Grand Prix designs here, like the Wally ninety three. Have been involved with through the Rolic office. Uh, the Club Swan 125, which is a foil assisted monohull that will be launched uh, later this year uh, from the board of uh, Juan Kumajan. And the AC50 foiling cats here, which are, well, I guess have been revived in the Sail GP. Uh, and finally, the first bona fide foiling um, monohull, with the exception of moths, I suppose, showing uh, so much mainsail twist. We're looking at the lured side of all of these boats, but uh, the AC-75 has so much mainsail twist that the lured side of the head of the main is actually pushing the head back to windward, so giving a quite a large component of its writing moment. Um, and that is going to be fascinating when, uh, when, when they um, lock horns. Um, on the lower left here, we've got a 60 meter super yacht, which is currently in build in Holland, it's still on schedule. We have the multi-mast Dyna rig uh, proof of concept here in the middle. Uh, and funny enough, some commercial work, which is um, we're hearing more and more of um, you know, requests for help with um, hybrid propulsion schemes, um, some conventional sail arrangements, um, some wing masts, some other systems. Uh, but that's coming, um, you know, mainly due to um, changes in, uh, in, in, in taxation, really, for, the, for fossil fuels. Uh, and then finally, something which is, uh, I guess, closer to my heart at weekends, um, um, when you know, when work and uh, family commitments allow, uh, especially since um, North uh, Kite Boarding came back um, under our roof, we have um, there's a group of us helping the kite board uh, team, um, kite surfing team, to understand which of our aero tools might be um, might, might be of use to them. Uh, where you know, we're never going to be. Uh, kite designers, but for sure, uh, some of the tools that we have developed will will help those guys to to move the game along. So anyway, um, sorry for the brevity. I hope there's something of interest there. Um, I think uh, I'll hand back to Prof and um, open up to I expect some some Q and A. Thanks very much. Great stuff, Jez, and uh, thanks a million. Um, absolutely fascinating glimpse into the future. And I have to say, Jez, you brought me a, a, a misty-eyed memory of yachting around St. Bart's, which is there on the mighty Quokka, yourself, myself, and Nigel in 2014. It was a good trip. <laughs> yeah, we're very lucky. It's always a, it's always a good trip when, you, when you're out there. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, we, we probably, I know we should finish up, um, but maybe we might just have a few questions. I know we're slightly over the hour, but I think we're, we're going well. Um, Shano, the, a question there from Dara, Dara McDonough. Does 3DI have a longer lifespan due to less stretching? So give us, give us the, the 40 second answer, Shano. Yeah, well, um, it does have a longer lifespan, that's for sure. Um, the... It, it, yeah, in two parts, yes. Um, basically, the first part, does it have an ultimate longer lifespan? Yes, because of our delamination. Uh, we've eradicated that delamination issue. So in terms of actually the sail physically holding together over time, the sail is going to physically last longer, yes. The second part, in performance terms, will it hold its shape longer? Again, the answer is yes. Basically, the optimization that Jeremy was showing and how we lay the, 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 uh, the tapes out uh, along the sail uh, basically matching the load paths of the sail more efficiently. That helps the sail, uh, the structural integrity of the sail take the load more efficiently. So it's a yes to both 
both sides of that question. Is that Great. 40 seconds or am I still on one there? Great stuff. And um, one, uh, uh, I, I love this, obviously, uh, Kean Byrne, does the available computing power allow for the full RAMs models for each design you work on or do you employ potential flow models on a more regular basis? Now, I would ask Nigel to answer that. <laughs> yeah. Nigel, I know you're jumping to answer that, but I, yeah. I'll just ask Jester to pick that one up in 30 seconds. Um, Kian, uh, I love that's a great question. And um, the answer is actually we, you know, we, we now use uh, RAND simulation, or we, we, can, we can use it on any design that we need to. Um, I remember working. Um, in the Luna Rosa um, America's Cup design team in Valencia in 2004. Um, and we would, we would wait patiently for literally a week for one RAND simulation of a sale. And now regularly, we will do a couple of hundred of those every night on the cluster. Um, so do we do it on, it, 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 I would, it, I'd be lying if I said we did that on every sale. You know, um, many of the sales that we build are evolutions of sales that we know really well. So it's not really necessary. But we are now in the position where we can do that on any sale that design that we need to. And we can do it overnight. That's the really cool thing. Um, in fact, that, that was a, you know, in the, in the dark days of the um, recession after, uh, sorry, after the financial crisis, we got quiet. And one of our... Um, one of our uh, projects there was to make RAND's supercomputing more accessible to our design team. And um, uh, I, myself and a couple of other guys got in touch with um, the University of Southampton. And over that time, we've got it to the point where it was one simulation a week to, the, to, to now where we, we do literally hundreds a day. And, and any of our design team, all of our design team have access to that system from wherever they are in the world. So it's a, an incredible resource. And yes, we can use it on pretty much anything we want. And the cool thing about it is we pay, a, it costs good money, you know, costs real money to do that sort of simulation. But the deal that we have is exclusive to us and it's kind of like a gym membership. So the more we use it, the better value it is. And we're addicted to it now. <laughs> we use it for everything. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, listen, guys, um, I think we might wrap it up there. Um, how, how long have we gone? We've gone, uh, we've gone seven and a half minutes over time. And uh, given the amount of material that we've covered, um, I think that it's been an absolutely fantastic session. Uh, so, Nigel, can you uh, give us a 12 seconds summary? <laughs> well, I mean, the change from when I started in 1981 to now in design is so different. We started on working from a single piece of paper with a few numbers written on it. And now we have, we have the full example there from Jezza of what's possible for our sale designs. And at no stage in my career has the design team been more important in the projects than they are today. And it's fantastic to have Jez with us tonight. So Jez, thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic. And some uh, closing words from the uh, North Sales Outpost and Greystone, Shano. <laughs> Yeah, look, actually, to be honest, I don't think I can really follow up much better than that from Nigel. I, I like, like himself, I've been doing this from 1999 and the rate of progress is just insanely, it's just insanely quick. So uh, people like Jez are at the cutting edge of it. We're very lucky to have someone uh, of Jez's uh, ability on with us tonight. And, and, and also just to keep us up to speed and educated what's going on and the latest developments. Um, but uh, yeah, really, thanks, Jez, for doing all the, the stuff tonight. And uh, thanks, everyone else, for, for tuning in. It's great to get such a good response. Great stuff. Thanks, lads. And uh, just to sign off from, from us here, um, and look after yourselves, everybody. I know it's uh, been a, a little bit of a tough time, but hopefully we'll see you all on the water very soon. Thanks a million to Jez uh, in particular. And thanks, Nigel. Thanks, Shane. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all very, very soon indeed. Good night. Thanks, folks. Thanks, guys. Well done. Well done, North Sales. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we want to, uh, Prof, do we want to open it up? Well, we could do if anybody wants to have a bit of crack. <laughs> we have no. Can we turn on videos and all that stuff? Did I on new channel? They're on now. Ben Jem. Serious question, Dave, come in here. Sorry.
story with the buy at the moment. Okay. Get out the, get out the beers, huh? <laughs> great, great grandmother. Miles ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. A nice one, Connor. There you go. Good man, Connor. Good man. Yeah. Oh, you're back. Thank you. Oh, no. Oh, just uh, a... No, no, he's fine. Prof, you can unshare your screen. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It was Nana Gray. What was Nana's name? Okay. <laughs> so, guys, I think uh, I'm going to have to just... Un there's so much noise, so I'll just... If you want to unmute yourself, if you're going to talk, then, like, just unmute yourself, because uh, otherwise I think I, no one can hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's just become a free-for-all. Oh, so. there's Peter. Hey, you're oh, got, yeah, we, Spainer, how are you? Connor, do you want to, um, I'll try and, uh, Connor Clark. Connor, you should, be, uh, you should be back on the mic there. You want me on the mic? <laughs> I've got a beer so I could listen. <laughs> Connor, is that a Peroni? That is Red no. Stripe, is it? A? No, it's a Vera Moretta <laughs> oh, from no. Garda. I'm missing it. Jeepers, and you got it in Ranala? Yeah, they had it across. Well, of course, you can get anything in Ranala. <laughs> get from Tesco's, Prof. It's oh, yeah, yeah. where the issues are. Yeah. You're going to enjoy the luxuries. I'm going to go to the fridge now and get myself a Heineken Zero. Hang on. <laughs> Spainer, what color, what flavor beer have you got going on over there in Malaysia? Well, it's, it's very oh, posh <laughs> here in the, the, the Royal Sinesta Yacht Club. Uh, yeah. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Nice glass of red. <laughs> well done, guys. That was interesting. Yeah, I thought yeah. that that was actually, I know counterintuitively, more interesting than the ones we've had up till now. Much more techy, arguably more geeky, but I thought more informative and, uh, I don't know, I found myself more interested in it. But maybe I'm just a fucking geek. <laughs> well, that, that's a fact. That's really nice. To, yeah, that's nice you to say, Connor. That's actually that's good to hear. And that's a compliment from Prof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I, I ask think, Nigel a question? Yeah, go for it, Liam. But I was just going to say something there to Connor. Okay, I, I, I can see that, how I can see how North can provide this service to, you know, AC seventy fives and AC fifties and so on. But does somebody who's buying sails for a thirty foot cruise or an X three three two, for example, or a Sigma? or a Carby 29, get the same level of service and the same okay. design input? Okay, well, the, sh the short answer to that is uh, no. We don't do that full process for every single sale. You couldn't possibly do it. But what, um, what the, what's really interesting is that the, what Jez does now, um, he runs a section of the business called Design Services. And what the Design Services does is that they, um, they're a separate department He's still part of the design team, but he, they run special projects. So let's say uh, I've only had the full experience with design services on one occasion. I've used them uh, for a couple of times for smaller things, but we did a class 40 for a client in, um, in Ireland where back, in the, back in the heyday before the tiger and, and stopped roaring. And um, it was a brand new uh, Owen Clark design, Generation 4, Class 40. It's up to the cutting edge, up to the minute boat. It had a Southern Spars rig, and Southern Spars are a division of North Sails. And it had, uh, and then we used it had 3DI or 3D, I know it would have been 3DL in those days, I think. I can't remember if I'm honest. But um, it, uh, we, did the, we did the full design services um, on that project, and it was absolutely fantastic. So, but what, what happens is, Liam, is that these, you know, the, we talk, you always talk about the trickle down effect, you know, the, and you hear about the trickle down effect from all sorts of sports and you know, like, like motor racing and all that sort of thing. But 3DI is a genuine uh, trickle down effect from the America's Cup. You know, it started, 3DI started live with, with the Alinghi team in 2007, I think it was. Prof will correct me if I've got the date wrong. But it it, but so it started there. Uh, they never, they didn't use it to race, I don't believe. Um, but they, um, that's where it started life. And I must admit, I, as, as most of you know, I've been doing this forever. And when I first saw the first, the concept for the first 3DI sale was being talked about inside North Sales, I took one look at it and I thought to myself, that's never going to work. 
and of course I couldn't be further from the truth. And there were a few teething troubles at the start, as, as you would expect with all of these things, but um, very quickly it became apparent that, that this product was going to really lead the way. And, and, and North Sales is a fantastic company. I mean, I've been with, I've been with North since 94 now, and you know, I couldn't work for another brand. That's and it's all point. about, yeah, something like that, Morris. But they have, the way they think, so the, one of the early sets of 3D eye sales they did, well, I think uh, was for a book called Heratos. I think that's the right pronunciation. It's a massive thing. It's like a Ketrick yeah. 180 um, footer, I mean, enormous. And they, so they, they did, so I would have started a bit smaller, a bit lower, <laughs> a bit lower cost on the development program, but, but not more sales. They started with the biggest thing and they figured if they can make it work for that, then it'll trickle down. So this is a long answer for you, Liam, but I wanted to just give you the full story. So, so that, so that starts at America's Cup, it goes to Supiot, and then slowly, 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 it trickles its way down. And now we're using 3DI on Sigma 33s. We're using them on Trapper 250s. We're using them on international moths to win the world championship. You know, they're, they're, uh, sitting here today, you can have a 3DI sale for anything. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a dinghy or whether it's a super yacht or even one of those commercial ships that Jez has, has got on his, uh, on his last Into the Future presentation. So does, does the Sigma 33 get the full treatment of the design services? No, it, not, as an individual class, no, it doesn't. But what it's benefited from is the last 10 years of development that's gone into every other 3DI major project. And that trickle down effect has now enabled us to do 3DI sales for Melges 24s, Melges 20s, you know, all of these little sports boats where the, the original 3DI structure was just too stable and it wasn't suitable for small boats with bendy rigs and all that sort of thing. Now with the people like Jez and the other engineers working on the, on the structures of 3DI, we can produce a 3DI sail to, to do practically anything. And I it's think a, it's, that, it's that trickle down, you know, it's generally trickled down from the very top and it's now in the real small boats. And I can, I can uh, I'll fess up to the fact that all of the hard lessons were learned on the America's Cup budgets and the Volvo budgets. <laughs> And yeah. uh, I think pretty much every one of our clients should be glad of that. You know, um, we, 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 uh, those are the guinea pigs, you know, and willful, you know, they're, they're happy to do our testing for us because it gives them an edge. Uh, or, you know, there is a, a, a chance that it gives them an edge. And would, it we'll be right, be... Jez, would, it, would it be right, Jez, to say that the work that you do in NDS, North Design Services, um, there would be learnings and developments from that that would transfer into if you like the mainstream business would that be a, a kind of a transfer of knowledge type thing uh yes but it's not the only route um within the company it's um probably one of the smaller ones in a sense because um actually if, if you think of the, the the point of our design service consultancy is that most of the product of the work goes outside of North Sales, let's say. And um, it's as much about developing the yachts or the rigging systems or the technology as it is the sales. Um, so, so there is some, but there is still more from the Grand Prix classes, from the America's Cup classes, from the offshore classes. Those are the environments where we really learn the most, the fastest. And every year we have a, a, a big design gathering where we, where we bring all of those lessons into the, um, into the, let's say the structural templates that we use for all of the 3DI sales it's and the mold libraries. I remember, um, do you remember Nigel and Shane when we looked at the first suit of Sigma 33 3DI yeah. Mordrax yeah. sales in, uh, in Dunleary? And yeah. we, were, we went out in the Sigma 33, pretty windy conditions. And we had the number one general, 3DI Nordak, number one general, full main, sheeted the thing on, sheeted them in, looked up. And I, I mean, I was just blown away by... It, yeah, it's not, it's not like a normal Dacron cell that you look at, is it? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. so different. It's so different. No. Yeah. yeah how, the, how, the, how the 3DI has evolved. And, and that's the thing, it's still evolving. It's not, you know, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. Um, the, the biggest, process. the biggest thing for me, Shano, has been the development for 
boats like uh, well like the international moth is maybe not so such a big thing because it's quite static in its setup but the, the big one for me is the the ability to make sails for um for melges 20s and 24s and these small jibs that you couldn't get enough depth in before they were just too stable they wouldn't do all the right things and we in the melges recently you know this, this might sound a bit it's a little bit grand prix of a comment but it, up until very re up until 3DI, if you wanted to be serious in the Melchus 24, you couldn't really do two big events with the same head saw. You know, you're only allowed one jib in the 24. And if you wanted to be, if you wanted to be world champion like Connor Clark and Prof and the guys, if, if you can't be going out there with a with a with a jib that's um, done two two regattas, you've got to start with a brand new one. We went to the worlds. Admittedly, I'm not sailing at that level these days, but. Um, we went to the Worlds uh, last year with our team and uh, we had a brand new set of 3DI sails in the trailer box and we opted to use a jib that had done five regattas. And I mean, most, most of those were weekend events, but we also did one four day event, I think. So it's probably done four, 13 or 40, maybe 15 days racing. And we've held the two sails up, the new one and the old one, and we couldn't, could not see the difference. And that, in itself is unreal for a small boat like that because the jib just I would never have admitted it. that to me <laughs> <laughs> i would hope not connor because if i've trained him properly he would never yeah. say that <laughs> but no i mean I, it's it's it, but small that's the big thing for me now shana you see all the glamour yachts and we know we know that uh, the next open 60 that launches is going to have the all singing dancing super duper raw 3di stuff and and we expect to see that because that's where it all started. But you don't expect to see. I didn't expect this jib. I had, I had the same mindset for the, the jibs. I thought we we're going to be turning them over as quickly as we were the plastic sails. But um, it's massive, the difference. And I think the other thing, which I wanted to say earlier, but we, I was conscious that we were going to go over time, was that, the, you know, this rather silly situation we have with IRC sails, where every six months you remeasure them because they've shrunk a little bit and you nibble a little bit off your rating. Well, you can't do that with 3DI because they don't shrink, you know? And they, they hold their original shape that much longer. And, you know, there's, there's a whole pile of, of benefits to the, to the no film thing. And- uh, No, I'm, I'm going to lose out on a ton of IRC measuring work as a result of that. <laughs> I've, I've, there's not many people <laughs> still tuned in here. Well, the, love, the love tape still shrink change. You still have to do it, obviously. Yeah. You know, but you don't get the girth shrink. The tape measure, the shrink. The tape, tape measure gets longer. That's true. Every yeah. year. The later it gets in the evening. I'm seeing some illustrious attendees here. Michael Brown, the, the, the uh -huh. one-time bowman on Connor Clark 1720 is there. With Is that Ethan or Josh Browner? Josh, you want to say hello? Hi. Oh. <laughs> Look at oh, that. I had the wrong thing. That's the effect. How are you doing, Mikey? Yeah, good. Good stuff. Good Apart stuff. from that, Josh just wanted to say hello and he's just watching, weren't you? Even though you should be in bed. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. We hope to see you on 40 Lip soon. And Noel Butler, are you still down there in, uh, are you still down there in Kerry? I am indeed. <laughs> You're looking Lovely, a bit blue yeah. there, Noel. You, you, you haven't got the, the COVID, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I oh, hope the electricity bill. <laughs> I got the, I found I was walking on the beach and uh, I found this washed up, so I thought it was apt for Kerry. You know, yeah, yeah, clearly you look at you looking at home there, though. I'm trying to blend in with the Healy Rays, you know. There you, go. <laughs> <laughs> you look like your man Healy Ray. That's it. I'm trying to blend in. Found his hat washed up on the beach, so you know. And as long I can, as the body didn't. It's okay. I, I can see. I can see my teammate from Aurelia from the Round Ireland 2018 and Dunleary Dingle 2019. Are you there, Neeler? Um, Hi, Prof. Here now. Yep, still with you. Very interesting. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Did you enjoy that. Oh, brilliant! Brilliant stuff. Yeah, we nice. needed. We we. You were great in our races. God, you you made us learn an awful lot. You're fantastic. Great to have you on board. Oh, that's enough of that now, Neil. Yeah, yeah you, you don't you don't have to say that, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the mute button, Shane? <laughs> and come here to me. Is uh, is Dave Cotter there? No, he's, he's gone. Uh, he's, he, he was there. He's just gone. No. Who is he? No. He's there. I think he's still there. 
he's probably still there, but he's probably off doing something. Yeah, absolutely. And tell me, Ella, that was a good question. Where, where, are, you, uh, where are you transmitting from, Ella? Um, Portsmouth in the UK. Oh, wonderful. Pompey, my old stomping ground. <laughs> yeah, I used to live down in Southsea. Oh, yeah, that's where I am. Very good. The home of many a good a top sailor. Well, yeah, I'm from Hamble originally, but I live in Pompey because I go to the uni. So. Very good. Excellent. Very good. good memories great. in Hamble. Great, great, to have you. <laughs> great to have you along there, Ella. Ralph, uh, can I throw a question in here that Nigel might have set up? What, what's happening with um, manufacturing? Uh, you know, with regard to ordering sales, is there going to be a big lack of backlog of 3DI sales? And, you know, thinking that already for next season, is that backlog, I guess Sri Lanka's closed at the moment. Um, okay, yeah, no, yeah. All right, Dave, that's a, that's a good question. We actually, we, um, we suffered a very serious hit in global production um, at the start of this problem. We, we've, we're trying to avoid the, it sounds really bad, but forgive me for saying it, we're trying to avoid the C word. We've even given, a message from our um, our men in, in Australia that they're not mentioning the C word anymore. They've uh, they're getting away with it a little lighter that down there than we are. So, um, but yeah, so we had a serious hit right at the start. Sri Lanka actually closed, and um, I think when Sri Lanka's on song, they've got about twelve to fifteen hundred people working. So you can imagine that that's uh, when that stops, the production goes it takes a serious hit. But it wasn't only there, we've got other production lots in Spain and France and the UK. I think the UK didn't stop at all, Jez, did it? I think it kept going, although on right. the yeah. skeleton crew in the end. Yeah. But to get to the point of the question, Dave, the, the delivery dates are actually, they're not too bad. Um, Sri Lanka's got, Sri Lanka runs three shifts and I think two shifts are now back on and going. And the third shift, I, I, I got a feeling it's very soon, maybe the end of the month. It was all government related. They had the, the factory had the all clear to, to run and manufacture, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't get the people there. It was just actually getting the people to the factory that was the, the real issue, um, distance travel and all that sort of thing. But we've got, basically, we prof looked today, we were talking about um, yeah. sales for Round Ireland. So with a modified date for Round Ireland, if we get our skates on, we can still deliver 3DI sales for that race, which is at the end of August. So I, I don't think it's going to be too bad, Dave. Oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because we've got two plants now, obviously the, the Nevada in the States, the original 3D plant, and the plant in Sri Lanka. And when they're both working at full speed, they can churn out a lot of sales. I don't know the number. Obviously, it depends on the size and the complexity and, and all that sort of thing. But uh, they can pump out a lot of sales. And I think I don't think it'd be long before we catch up. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Feeling, yeah. quick, quick question for you, Dave. Uh, just... Um, on the, the, the waiver gata coming up in September, I mean, given the, the guidance and the stuff from the last couple of days, are you, how are you feeling about that one? Do you think that's, that's you're going to be able to, what sort of form is that regatta going to take or is it still a bit unclear yet? Um, it's, it's, becoming le it's becoming a bit clearer for us because our, our main sponsor is Fingal. So Fingal County Council events team are briefing us. So we had a meet this morning, actually. Um, I think it's going to be very much focused on racing. We, we we're essentially cancelling nearly all the entertainment. Yeah. We just can't work for courts and queues and stuff like that. Um, and if that frees up a bit, we'll ramp that side up. But thing all events, you know, this social distancing on boats is the big question, isn't it? Um, we're working on the base of the regalis going ahead. All the sponsors are still in place. Um, it won't be as fun ashore, but I don't think Dublin will be as fun ashore. Um, but we'll do our bloody best to make it uh, good fun at sea. You know, with the revised kind of scheduled races and that to make it a bit more interesting. So we're, we're working on the basis full steam ahead. to say sponsors in place, all the organisations in place. The only thing we're scaling down is the entertainment side of things. And we'll have to put in a load of COVID measures. We're putting in digital scanners when you walk in, that kind of thing. And again, Fingal will be dictating largely to us and whatever happens with our sailing, etc. So we are tentatively full steam ahead. But I think in reality that Sailing is probably still a 50 50 sport for racing at the moment here. Very good, very yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is that uh, who else now do we have here? Oh, Dave Cotter, are you back? I'm amazed there's still people 
know. wanting to listen to us grown up. <laughs> Nothing else to do these days, Shane. <laughs> You're forced into it. <laughs> We've got you. We've got the better to do. Good stuff. This old porn. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a close call, I'd say, to, uh, <laughs> Connor, as well, was it? <laughs> Nigel, we have the primary Helms person from New Largo on the call. I did see that. Yeah, Molly, are you there? You'll have to. Oh, Molly, I've, ta I've taken over her computer, Nigel. <laughs> oh, hi, Dennis. Yeah, how are we doing? Very good, very good. I was it's just good. wondering the trickle down effect that all the design went into our boat and then the small print on the side, do we get a rebate from jo what Jonesy benefited from? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Is that possible? Yeah. The, uh, which bit did Jonesy benefit from? So, Brian. He's oh, gone, I think. Is I he think gone? he has, yeah. I think he's gone, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. It's safe to talk now, is it? It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, you're, I think, let's just scan the list. I think you're safe, Dennis. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't well, drop you in something. No, I'm okay, thank you. They're over there. Is that um is that Neil Van Manen, former enterprise maestro? Because it just says Neil Van or is it Nell Van? No. Not sure on that one, Prof. No. <laughs> sure. Well, Neil Van Manen was an enterprise, awesome enterprise sailor from Greystones, but I don't know if um if he's uh uh, there was, um, is he Roy? He must be Roy's brother, is it? I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. So, um, so there you go. Anyway. Will you wrap it up, lads and ladies? I reckon. Uh, my my think glass is so. quite empty I think so. here. Yeah, it's probably time to get the beer, Morris. Be a good hour. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm going to get another Heineken Zero. Good man. Good man. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks very much, guys. All right. so, uh, where is you all? Good to see everyone. Bye thanks bye. for joining, guys. Doing? Yeah, bye thanks bye. a lot. Cheers. Well done. Bye bye. Cheers, Renner. Uh, right, Jazza. I think we'll uh, we'll knock off. Maybe we'll do a separate uh, separate call. Yeah.